right, welcome along to the RT Soccer Podcast. I'm Raf Giallo and I'm alongside Jim McMahon of RT Sport Online this week. We've got a bumper crowd this uh, for this uh, for this episode. Miguel Delaney, Chief Football Writer for The Independent. We've also got former Ireland, Sunderland, Wolves and Manchester City striker Stephen Elliott and former Dundalk goalkeeper and multiple League of Ireland winner Gary Rogers. And now we've got a lot to talk about. Premier League reaction, Champions League, a lot of things happening in the League of Ireland and also, there's going to be an Ireland squad going to be named this week. So, Jim, loads to talk about. Mm-hmm. And that means, unfortunately, fortunately, from my point of view, some event that happened 20 years ago in the middle of the Pacific won't be coming up. Yeah. Um, yeah. When Saipan became the, a very common word in the, in the Irish psyche, uh, it was yesterday, 20 years ago, that I think Mick sent um, Roy Keane home. And then there was the Willy Wonty uh, government jet, J.P. McManus, Bertie O'Hearn getting involved. Then Kennedy, I think, uh, Keane's solicitor, got in contact with Tommy Gorman. And, and Tommy did an interview with Roy Keane. And Roy was somewhat contrite. So we thought then that Roy might be back on the plane, but that wasn't to be the case. And four days later, Ireland started their their campaign in with a draw against Cameroon on a, a day I remember it because Eamon Dunphy on RT wore the Cameroon colours that morning on the, of that match. So that was it. So that was the whole week. That was the whole sort of 20 years ago, you know, encapsulated into a few sentences. Yeah, and will never be spoken of again. Again. And, yeah, so, <laughs> as I said, we've got lots to talk about between Premier League, Champions League, finals, obviously coming up uh, this Saturday as it well. It wasn't a row, but who was right? Yeah, we've got Champions League final, obviously, um, on um, RT2 and the RT player on Saturday as well. And Miguel's on with us for the first part of the podcast. So we're going to start with the Premier League and Champions League. So if you're looking for timestamps in terms of what's coming up, if you're on YouTube, go to the RT Sport channel, go to the description below this episode and you'll find everything there if you want to kind of skip ahead to something or jump back to something else. But we're going to start with the Premier League. So and uh, Manchester City champions for the fourth time in five seasons. Uh, Miguel, you were there at the Etihad on Sunday. In terms of the atmosphere, uh, in the ground and just the sense of emotion and how it changed, obviously, with the other, the Liverpool game ongoing against Wolves. What was your sort of reading of it as everything changed across the 90 minutes? Well, I mean, I think one of the great things about the final day is a- almost more than cup finals is how much the emotion of it, it how kind of uh, how, how that changes on the day, how charged it is. And how that transmits onto the pitch. And I'm, I'm sure the lads will be able to tell you much better, obviously, from a player's perspective. But, I mean, my, my reading of it, I haven't done a few now, is obviously just how that energy creates a potentially for wild things to happen. Players do things they'd never do. And, and you see some pretty extreme situations. I think that was pretty much the case in the day. I mean, right down to the fact what C- City hadn't come back from 2-0 down in a Premier League game in 17 years. Right, and right down to the fact that a Guardiola team like that and this city, who are what they are, were actually 2-0 down to Villa. And there was about five, ten minutes when it was looking like the only thing between Liverpool and the title was basically John Ruddy. Um, and, and, and that was, it, 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 it was that kind of feel from the, the whole day. Like I, I'd been at the, uh, the Real Madrid game at the Etihad, and this was a much better atmosphere. I mean, that was quite strange, actually, as an occasion. But, but this was so much better atmosphere going in. It, it was raucous. It, it sent the, the City team out quite primed to start. Then, of course, news immediately came true that the uh, that Wolves had scored, which which only kind of amplified the crowd. And then they when after that first ten minutes, when City didn't, it wasn't even that they didn't score. They didn't even test Olsen, who was clearly nervous. Um, suddenly, this kind of that the nerves transmitted over to the, or they went, went over to the other side. There was this this quiet in the stadium. There was that kind of split screen moment, which I suppose is a classic from the final day when just as Foden put the ball wide, um, so narrowly wide, the news came through that Mane had equalised for Liverpool. Within a few minutes then, Villa kind of sensed an opportunity, scored. Um, and for about half an hour, like City, City were completely gone. And then eventually, you know, they had a nightmare scenario of Coutinho scoring. And then, it, and then uh, uh, Guardiola did make some big subs, particularly Gundogan. 
And then from that, it was like, it was as if kind of going 2 0 down and all that changed it again. And City were released a little bit. And then once they got the first, I think it's Guardiola referenced himself, who was just like, he said they could smell the second and third. And that was it. There was just this momentum behind it. Um, but yeah, I suppose ultimately the day still comes down to City did the expected in the most uh, unexpected way. Yeah, and just another point, obviously in the aftermath, of course, I was just looking at uh, Pep's comments and it was sort of tied into something he'd said before that he, his sense, you know, in the UK that everybody is supporting Liverpool and I don't know where that sort of emotion comes from, but then um, in the aftermath of winning the title, he just goes, I'm sorry, people have to admit it, this group of players are absolutely eternal because what we achieve is so difficult to do. It's the bit at the start, I'm sorry, people have to admit it. Now that could be just a linguistic turn of phrase, but... I wonder, is there a sort of sense of resentment or something there, you know, in terms of the mentality um, or what sense do you get from it? Well, I, I think there's a few things going on there. Um, for, I mean, first of all, just talking to someone, like I've covered Guardiola a lot now. And like the first Champions League final I went to was his against United in 2009. But like, obviously, you, you don't, you, you, it's when they're kind of in the country you're in and you're going to press conferences a lot that you get a proper sense of them. And I remember talking to someone from Barcelona who was saying that, made, made the point after he left there, Guardiola is easy to like from afar because he can be quite a passive, aggressive and difficult character. And I think what's happened a little bit in England, there's, there's a few things with him where, I mean, first of all, it's like, obviously, I suppose, to, to create a little bit of a, a siege mentality in his own team, he, he uses that. But it's also like he tries to kind of transpose the dynamic in Spain where he was at, you know, he's a Guardiola, or sorry, he's a Barcelona legend and is kind of a, a, a totem of the club. And, does, and he has always kind of grown up with the, with the Spanish, with the Spanish media, like Madrid basically being the, the institution there. So, I mean, first of all, there's a sense of him trying to transpose that. Secondly, of course, there's all this discussion about Manchester City and what they are, you know, a, a state project by Abu Dhabi. Um, but I mean, cause it's interesting listening to him. Well, well, he's, many, he's mentioned recently about how oh, our money is, um, people ask questions of that, but no one asks questions of American money and all this, we, uh, which is exactly kind of the, the defence lines that basically some of their public, their PR teams use, that Khaldun Al, Al Mubarak, the, um, the city chairman, used three years ago. Uh, and, and I suppose there is maybe that sense from him, given he's producing one of the greatest sides of all time, or, or at least overseeing one of the greatest sides of all, t- all time. And he's not feeling the appreciation for it. And, then, and that probably comes from what City, City are. Um, and then that transmits into a few um, <laughs> passive-aggressive comments in, in press conferences. I mean, the, the, but there's, there's no denying Guardiola. Whatever about the club he's at and whatever about his personality, there's obviously no denying his absolute genius. Yeah, and Stephen, another aspect, as, uh, as, as Miguel has said there, you know, Pep, obviously the construction of this team has been genius. But in terms of the narrative, in terms of how different Liverpool and Manchester City are, I was just reading a piece by Jonathan Wilson um, in The Guardian in regard to the fact that Pep and Klopp tactically seem to be kind of moving closer together, whereas they were always viewed as being diametrically opposed. So one is heavy metal football and uh, Pep's is obviously this kind of passing carousel that we would see at Barcelona in a loose term. Um, but tactically, do you feel, Stephen, that in a, the, the, there are a lot more similarities now between the way Liverpool and Manchester City play. Yeah, I think there is. I think one thing you'll say about both teams is when, when they don't have the ball, which is, which is very rare, actually, because both teams tend to have the ball an awful lot, they win it back so quickly. And it's, it's, you, you, when you're watching both teams, I, obviously on, on Sunday, I didn't actually know which game to watch. I didn't know which would be more kind of exciting, which was the best game to watch kind of from a, from a viewing point. But it's just... They, they just always seem to kind of get it done like in games and again it's like in the final in the, in the final tour like when when I, I agree with Miguel though I think City on Sunday they were really poor and it wasn't like you were watching Man City it was like the whole mm. emotion and everything of getting to the players to the stage and man, they weren't winning that ball that back as quickly as what they had been there. but Liverpool game was obviously a bit of nervousness there in that game too because you know I was flicking between both of them I didn't actually watch any any of the games kind of fully out but one thing I will say is yeah they, they get the ball up high and the, play, the players the players they have in offensive areas both teams it's it must be a real nightmare to play against because sometimes you're watching teams play against both of them this is and you're thinking why can't they keep the ball why are they just kicking it 
And it's these are top quality Premier League players they're playing against, and they just cannot keep. No team can really keep the ball against them, and that's opened me down to the kind of the way both teams press, and they press so high, but they do it. They set traps all over the pitch, and it's. Uh, it, you're watching them sometimes, even City there, watch, you're watching them sometimes in games and it feels like they've got extra players on the pitch. You, you're looking up and the, no one, when the, the score in the top of the corner of the screen, you're looking, is there, is there a red card in the opposition team here because they press so well and it's it's obviously down to the managers. They're, they're, they're the top of the game, both of them. And I think the two of them are, are improving each other. I think Pep has already said that he's never had a kind of somebody a rival like like uh, Jorgen Klopp and I think it's only good for football that the two of them kind of continue this rivalry but yeah they do they, they both of them want to win the ball up high and get, get the players that can make things happen on the ball as high up the pitch as possible and again defensively sometimes they kind of give up some goals but no, it is. It's, it's very similar. And I, I probably Liverpool slightly a little bit raw. They're kind of a little bit more off the cup. But I do think they're coming a little bit closer. And ultimately, the key to both the teams is getting the ball as quick as possibly back and hoarding teams without letting teams breathe. And again, it's phenomenal, both teams. It's, again, w- one point between them this year. And the, the points accumulated. I don't think we're ever going to see the likes again. Like you're at Liverpool, you're, win- you're getting 92 points and you're not winning the league again. It must be soul destroying. But... It is what it is, and I do think Klopp is right. You got it. You got to look at this Manchester City team and say what they're doing is incredible, and they are. They're, they're probably they're probably the greatest probably Premier League team of all time, in my opinion, for the the kind of consistency and it all. Like, and Liverpool aren't far behind them, but unfortunately for them, they just come up against this powerhouse, which is Man City. And I, I don't know how long it'll continue for, but from a neutral point of view, it, it's it's a great viewing. Yeah, certainly. And we'll, we'll talk about Liverpool in a little bit more detail later on. But as you said, the collective really makes the individual shine. So um, Gary and Stephen, I know I, I told you before we hit record that I get your players of the season that are not called De Bruyne or Salah. So we're going to do that. Gary, um, who is your pick and why? Um, I would go for Son. Obviously, when you, when you run out to the other two boys, where I think he's been tremendous. He often gets overlooked, I suppose, because Harry Kane is in the team. And Harry Kane, obviously, in England, is an England international and an icon there. But what he has done in terms of 23 goals this year, joint gold and boot winner, um, and the amount of assists he supplies, I think he's been a phenomenal player. Um, and I, I would go for him outside the other two. Yeah, and Stephen? Yeah, I'd probably have to go with uh, Thiago at Liverpool. I just think when he first came into the club, like there was a few question marks of whether he could kind of play this high tempo game. And obviously he picked up a few injuries. He, I think he picked up a couple of COVID kind of cases as well. And we don't we didn't quite see the best of him when he first came in. But I think this year he settled in the in the team and he and he started to kind of adjust his game to kind of play the way Klopp wants him to play. And I and I think what he has done in certain games this year has been incredible. And I think he's only going to go get better playing this Liverpool team. And they get they get into a stage now where you're thinking if Thiago wasn't playing for Liverpool, he's a, he's a massive loss. And I didn't think we quite felt that way about him when he when he first came over. But yeah, if you if you look at his his record of winning trophies at the clubs he's been at, he's he's phenomenal. And I do think he for me he's been a bit of a standout player just because of how it started for him in the league, but he's been outstanding this year for Liverpool. Yeah, now below the uh, title battle, of course, there was the top four. You mentioned Sonny Hung Min there, Gary. And uh, in regards to Spurs, obviously, you know, beating, well, and I'm sure they would have enjoyed that even more, beating Arsenal to a place uh, in the Champions League. But keeping Conte, the maybe more certain certainty around Harry Kane, Miguel, um, what does the future hold for Spurs now over the short term? Uh, well, I mean, Immediately, you can see it from some of the, the briefings and news report over the last two days that just being in the Champions League means Daniel Levy will uh, allow the club to spend more, which is pretty big. And I, and I suppose some of this is also a bit of a message to Conte and emphasising what's been said to him in meetings because the reality is there's still some doubt whether he stays next season, which is a remarkable situation, but I suppose speaks to, to Conte's status. And especially after this season, given... This is another, it's yet another season where it's a huge achievement from Conte. I think, I, I don't think that was kind of a Mourinho esque bit of self promotion when he, when he said it on Sunday. I think, I think it's genuinely true given where Spurs were. But um, Paris Saint Germain are now looking around. I think a lot of people expect Pochettino, maybe given all the upheaval at the club in the last week with Leonardo going, they expect Pochettino. I don't, I don't think Pochettino wants to be there much longer himself. Um, and Conte has been one of the names considered, um, but whether they see him as suitable for Paris Saint Germain is another question up in the air, and that will dictate whether he's at Spurs next year. But it's, it is a little bit up in the air, despite the certainty that comes 
with uh, Champions League qualification. But, I mean, ultimately, that's what Daniel Levy wants with his club, is these big games in that massive stadium. And I think of it like just getting back into the Champions League, even if Conte leaves, and even if that makes next season a little bit more, or a lot more uncertain, um, it's it's so huge for, for the club now. They're, they're back in it for the first time since the 2019 final. Yeah, and then down at the bottom, of course, Burnley went down, and there's they have obviously issues off the pitch in terms of finances. It's going to be quite interesting to see how they cope in the championship next season. Leeds and Everton staying up. Just on Everton, because they've been a bit of a mess, um, Stephen. Um, you know, hindsight's twenty twenty, obviously, but you know, you would look at someone like Frank Lampard uh, as a you know a relegation batter. It's not really a position he'd been in before. His teams don't tend to defend that well as much as they're quite progressive in attack. So it was a risk from Everton in that point of view. But do you think maybe stylistically to get the right players in, there's a potential for them along with the spirit that they've galvanised them themselves with at the end of this season that you know they can push on a little bit next time. Yeah, I think so. I think, listen, I think Everton, if Everton had been relegated, I think it would have been a huge story. Like Everton, they've been a stalwart in the Premier League. They're still kind of, I still look at them, I don't know about you guys, I look at them as one of the kind of bigger clubs historically in English football. And if they had been relegated, it would have been, would have been nuts. But no, I think Frank Lampard, he's got to be given credit because he came in and he, he took a lot of criticism as well because he wasn't picking up results. But I, th- I think the tournament was obviously the two games against Chelsea and Leicester when he kind of picked up kind of, them points where nobody really expected it, and I do. I think there's something there. Everton, obviously, there's a they, they need to they need to add quality. There's no doubt about that. Like there's there's certain certain positions on the pitch, and maybe kind of certain characters in the squad where you'd probably think, you know what, they might need a little bit more going forward. But I think Lampard's earned the right to kind of try and kind of bring in his bring in, bring in some more players in the off season and, and try and kind of stamp a little bit more of his, his style on on his, on his way of playing. But no, I think you, you got to give him credit because there was huge pressure there and. I think you've just seen the emotion and the relief when they, when they finally stayed up there last week. And obviously, they, listen, they, it looked like some of them might have been thinking about the holidays at the weekend against Arsenal. But no, I think he, I think he deserves, I think he deserves a chance, Frank Lampard. And as I said, there was a few question marks when he went in, but the fact that he's gone in, done his job, and he's kept them up, and that was that was that was the priority there. And I, I do think Everton can come again. There's the too big a club not to. I, I still think they'll attract good players, but again, it's up to Lampard to get the whoever players comes in that are the right players that fit the club yeah and Gary um, a club that Irish quite a few Irish people follow is Leeds um, they stayed up just about and Jesse Marsh uh, a manager talks a good game and all that how do you see them faring from next season onwards yeah it, it, it's, it's one of those it, it's definitely back to the drawing board for Leeds they'll obviously be delighted to remain in the Premier League but there's a hell of a lot of work to be done there obviously the style of play that they, they went about last year it's just it's just seeing them over over the, the finish line and Burnley getting relegated but uh, I'm just kind of on, on, on everything like I was absolutely delighted for Seamus Coleman like a real leader in the dressing room I think everyone you know at the club and, and the, certainly from an Irish perspective to see him um, you know, remain in the Premier League with, with everything. Obviously, being captain, I think it was it was tremendous for him. And Lampard singled them out, I suppose, for special praise. You know, the, the type of character he is and the, the leader he is in the dressing room and how important he is to that club. So it's obviously great for everything. But yeah, you're right. Like Leeds is a massive club in Ireland. Traditionally, there's loads of loads of supporter groups here and everything. So for them to, to stay in the Premier League will be massive. And um, there is a lot of work to do there. And um, you know, to, to build for next season. Yeah, and uh, Miguel, in terms of, uh, as mentioned, the, the the slight Irish angle there in terms of Seamus Coleman, and then obviously the likes of Burnley, Nathan Collins made a breakthrough. But when you look at the, the Irish involvement in the league, I saw um, Gavin Cooney from the 42 had actually tweeted an interesting stat about uh, the number of Irish, or the minutes the Irish players were getting in the in the Premier League over the last season. And it was, you know, it was less than 10,000 overall. Obviously, there's mitigating circumstances, plenty of injuries there for uh, the likes of Ida, Ama Bamadele, Matt Doherty towards the end of the season. And then you compare it to over 20,000 minutes the, the previous year. I mean, is that something you kind of pick up on as, you know, you cover games? Obviously, your remit is much wider than uh, just the, anything to do with Ireland. But is that something you kind of... Uh, that just kind of that you notice as you go along to games. Yeah, so summing up my remit now, I'm, I'm off to Wembley after this for uh, for Gareth Southgate's press conference. My my, my job, a, a, a Declan Rice style change. Um, no, but yeah, it, it, absolutely. And I mean, I suppose you mentioned there are mitigating circumstances, as you said. Um, and like even had had Darty 
not picked up that unfortunate injury a month from the season. We might have been talking about him in, in team of the season, given his transformation under Conde. And actually, when, when Doherty got injured, there, w- there was suddenly that, that drop-off from Spurs because Conte is so dependent on his, on his wing-backs doing the jobs that he needs. They're so crucial to his teams. So, I mean, I suppose that's one positive in that regard. But, yeah, his injury does feed into uh, a concern in terms of numbers. Um, I, I, I hope it's uh, given the numbers last season. It's just a, maybe just a temporary blip. But I suppose the one thing we can't really escape with all this is, I mean, the, the tendency is always to compare it to Irish players in England. Certainly, thirty, forty years ago, when you know we had so many players in in basically England's title-winning teams. But I think as much as to do with whatever about our own talent production, which pretty much everyone in football, including people in England, say is actually beginning to turn around a, a fair bit. Um, it, it also speaks of a lot of what the, what the Premier League is now, what the English top division is, because it's, it, it's, it's not what it was, I think, even 10 years ago. Now we're talking about given the money in it, given all these broadcasting deals, it, it, it is basically, in some ways, Europe's Super League. It's, it's the absolute top end of the game in terms of just being able to outspend absolutely everyone else and of course what that does is it creates uh, it creates a situation where it funnels the majority of the top players in the league up into that division which means that the threshold to be in it is much higher than it ever has been historically and means that i think it's naturally a lot harder for for irish players to break through. Even, even good standard irish players of, of the type we've had for so long Whereas previously they would have been straight into a Premier League mid-table club, just the way the, the way it is, it's the, the way the Premier League's catchment area is so global now means maybe the entry level is now more Championship, which is what we're seeing. So I, I while those figures are a slight concern, I don't think they're necessarily that they necessarily speak too badly of where we are, and I suppose more importantly of where we're going. Yeah, and where we're going, obviously, a lot more of the younger players with the Brexit ruling, of course, are going onto the continent, and we're going to see yeah. how that impacts the game. Um, now, at a time, there was just, a... Just, just on, actually, yeah. I think it's an interesting point. I, I, I was told recently that um, because of the Brexit ruling, a, a lot of Premier League clubs have actually taken their main scout out of Ireland. So they do everything through intermediaries or, or people they don't actually employ. I think the, one of the few top clubs that still has a full-time scout in Ireland... Is uh, is Manchester City? A, a lot of others are pulled away. I'm pretty sure Manchester United do too. But would need to check that out. But but City certainly do. But other clubs, just because of that, have moved scouts elsewhere. Yeah, that's, that is interesting. Um, in regard to um, Sunderland, of course, we can't uh, not mention their promotion to the Championship, Stephen. Obviously, you were part of a team when we're talking about so Irish players as a contingent. Sunderland at one point, uh, particularly when Roy Keane was manager, um, would have had a number of Irish players, including yourself. But um, in regards to making it back to the Championship after the long road they've been on, I think which was well document, documented in Sunderland Till I Die, which I'm sure the owners will make sure is consigned to the dust of history but uh just how, what what type of occasion was it for you yeah well, as i said I, I was down in uh down at wembley for the weekend and it was i think it was a, a kind of a build-up emotion and kind of just a relief for, for sunderland fans and anybody associated with the club obviously the, the sun until i die documentaries everybody's seeing them and they probably only showed a little bit of like what was really going on on at the club at the time obviously they they showed a kind of the so-called exciting bits that people think are going to make good footage but it's it's been a really kind of tough time being a Sunderland supporter in recent years like again you mentioned going back kind of previously obviously during the the Peter Reid era beforehand when they were challenging at the top end of the Premier League obviously then during Mick McCarthy's and Roy Keane's era when we were kind of both when I when I was lucky enough to be involved when we being promoted to the Premier League twice and we we're kind of in that kind of stage where you're kind of Get promoted in and around the kind of Premier League, but where the club have been lying for the last four years in League One, it's been really kind of a tough, tough, tough time for Sunderland fans. But there was over fifty thousand at the stage. I mean, honestly, I've I've been lucky enough to be, be in football grounds over the years where there's been really top atmospheres. Been lucky enough to play in some really good atmospheres, but I've never I've never seen an atmosphere like it. Then what was that Wembley when 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 that full time whistle went? It was kind of just sheer emotion and relief that the club are finally kind of seem to be back on the way and again it's 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 a it's a gigantic club Sunderland I think if 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 they kind of get a right up here the owners and they kind of 
they, they back it properly, then there's there's no there's no reason why they can't kind of challenge in the championship. Uh, sorry, challenge to put promotion from the championship again in the next couple of years because ultimately I think the club is all structured to be in the Premier League and it's 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 where it needs to be. I think everybody enjoys coming to play at Sunderland. I think it's it's a good football city and it, again to be like I said, be in the kind of tour tier of English football for four years was, was probably probably a really tough tough take for Sullivan fans but hopefully they're on the way and as I said they've got a really good manager and Alex Neil there he knows his stuff he, he's very very good on the game and he gets players working hard and again he's come in in the middle of the season into the club when it, when it was kind of on a really bad run of form and managed to turn things around and, and finish off with the ultimate game of getting promoted at Wembley About Alex Neil I hear he's quite thorough but would he be uh, the type of manager now that maybe other clubs maybe up that are currently in the championship that maybe the likes of Burnley could be looking at? Yeah, I think that's that's another thing. I think Sullen got to kind of look at what he's done when he's come in here with kind of uh, with the way he's kind of come in and changed kind of the way Sullen have played in a short space of time. He's got them a lot more kind of secure at the back. Sullen conceded goals. They were always kind of quite quite exciting going forward even under Lee Johnson but there was always that soft underbelly there where you felt like good at teams if they got on top of them they kind of crumble a little bit but he's come in and sorted that out and yeah I agree totally there's, there's a lot of clubs in the championship obviously Blackburn kind of Burnley teams like that that are looking for managers and again finan- I don't know the financial situation of these clubs but I do, I do think I think Alex Neal is kind of resides over in the northwest. so again if I was Sunderland I'd be tying him down pretty pretty soon to a contract and, and hopefully backing him in the transfer window and kind of letting him dictate wh- where, where the club is going because I do think he knows how to, he's, he's proven before he's can get out of the championship as well with, with his, during his time at Norwich so I think the club is in good hands of, finally and, and, and please God for, for the people of the city if you can start being on an up a trend again yeah we're going to talk about the Champions League final very very shortly obviously it's on this Saturday on RT television but uh, before that I did want to touch on pitch invasions very briefly um, there have been a few situations that turned ugly over the last uh, over the last week and I think three particular incidents but uh, Gary what's your experience of them because I know you've had the kind of happier end of it with uh, you know title celebrations with Dundalk but any kind of uh, any moments that have been a little bit hairy yeah, I've had, I've had one or two hairy moments, uh, particularly I had one in Tala uh, around Paddy's Day where I think the, the, the Rover supporters really enjoyed themselves and one or two of them ventured onto the pitch to have a, to have a pop at me but got dragged <laughs> off um, by Damien Lynch and I had to, had to visit the Garda station afterwards to put in a report so it was uh, definitely uh, a few interesting ones but uh, the, the, there was nothing serious there but just somebody enjoying their, their Paddy's Day festivities decided they want to come on and have a pop at me in the game so uh, I have a small bit of experience in them alright How about you Stephen? Yeah I can't to be honest with you I can't really remember I've, as I said I've been promoted a few times and, and won cups and, and I've been in playoffs where I've lost games where it could have been on the other side of it but I don't know I can't really remember any pitch invasions may, may, there may have been I think at the end of a game, I don't. I think maybe at Sunderland a couple of times, some fans come on the pitch, but it wasn't really what we had been seeing in recent times. I don't know. I just think it's getting a little bit more. Do you know what I think it is? I think the supporters see the, this on the television, obviously see see it all in the news, and obviously there's people out there think, you know, what? we're just going to do it anyway. And it's it's. I know. I, me personally, I don't think it's good. I, I even. Uh, even like when no one when you see children running onto the pitch to ask for players' jerseys, I, I think that's wrong as well. I know obviously I would say, oh look how how cute that is the little kid, but you 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 think of many kind of kids are at football grounds. Imagine every parent said to child, one run on and get the pitch, and we'd have hundreds and possibly thousands of kids on the pitch. And I don't know, I just think the pitch is for the players, and and the you can stay in the stay in the stand and and still enjoy it. Like, I think there's nothing better than a full kind of stage and enjoying a victory when I think when it just it looks a bit messy when everybody comes onto the pitch now again maybe not everybody agrees with me but I just think it's you're a football player like you want to be safe on the pitch and all it takes is one idiot and again I know they do searches outside grounds but they could have anything in the pockets or you know what I mean and it, all it takes is one instant where like even that headbutt on Billy Sharp I thought it was an absolute disgrace the other week at um and not in forest like he basically could have died. Do you know what I mean? If he falls or he, he takes a bang to the head in the wrong area, he could be dead. And it's again, this needs to be kind of taken seriously. I I, I just I don't know. It doesn't sit right with me. I think players, the pitches should be for players, and obviously if managers want to come on and applaud the fans, but fans just stay off. Enjoy enjoy the celebrations from the from the ground. It, it, I think it makes it more spectacular when everybody stays in the stays in the stand celebrating. 
Yeah, and I can imagine governing bodies are obviously going to be looking at sanctioning this a uh, bit a bit more harshly in future just to mitigate it. But obviously we're going to turn to the Champions League now and the final is this Saturday, Liverpool versus Real Madrid, live on RT2 and the RT player from 7 o'clock and then kick off at 8 o'clock. So we'll have all the build-up, all the live commentary and then given, uh, given away a lot of finals, particularly Liverpool this season, um, how they've ended, I don't know what time that's going to end. Uh, probably will go to penalties. But um, Miguel, uh, before, and um, once, uh, once uh, Liverpool reached the final, I think Salah tweeted straight away, you know, that he wanted Real Madrid in terms of revenge for 2019. But I think in this game, it's a case of be careful what you wish for. Yeah, maybe, especially suddenly there's that little, I mean, as has been the case with Madrid all season, I've, I've been lucky enough to be at all six of Madrid's knockout games. Um, and it's amazing, even when you would think <laughs> this isn't a great team, they often much hope, they just find a way. And that's something with, the instinct of the club, with the identity of the club. And again, you'd wonder, given, given what you're saying there, whether it's another case where suddenly little things are going their way ahead of this weekend. Liverpool have obviously been so buoyant. And even, even though they, they pretty much accepted that they wouldn't win the title, the reality of not winning it, especially given how that final day went, you never know how that's going to affect things. And the, the, the lads will talk on that as regards to psychology. Then, of course, as we've mentioned, Thiago, uh, I'd agree with the, with the boys. I think he's one of the players of the season. He's suddenly gone from someone who was an option for Liverpool to basically their best midfielder or their most uh, influential midfielder. And he's now, he's got an Achilles problem. It's not a long-term issue, but he is sweating on the final. Um, there's also, what, I mean, what people are, are nearly expecting in the build-up, given what happened with Mbappe, is that what we could see next is, especially maybe with a few timed front pages on Mark or Ass in the next few days is, 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 is a few featuring Mohamed Salah or Sadio Mane going to Real Madrid. And it maybe just, and, and, and given Madrid's run, I mean, I, like if, if this was basically a normal football match with everything going to plan, I, I would have Liverpool quite comfortable winners, I'd say. Well, maybe not comfortable, but what? 2-0, uh, 3-1 or something like that. Uh, whereas just with, with the feel of this season, with everything build up, I think now it just becomes... 50-50 um, and I suppose even even connected to the Mbappe stuff Madrid will want to make a point or, or certainly Florentino Perez will be stressing to the players to make a point yeah um, Stephen in regards to some of what Miguel has said there especially about Real Madrid and just you know there's something inexplicable about the way they've sort of managed games it's almost like they thrive on chaos and then in the chaos the older heads the Benzema's the Modric's you know it's like the eye of the storm they're in that little kind of cam zone and then they're able to kind of run a game uh, in that period um, you know they start games slowly uh, it's a, a, almost a case that Liverpool just need to catch them early and then just try and uh, try and get control of the game as early as possible. I think so, yeah. I totally agree with Miguel there. Obviously, on any other game, you're looking at the quality of players and the squads and the team. Liverpool, you, you tap them favourites all day long. But this is Real Madrid we're talking about. And they're, they're an absolute powerhouse in world football. And it's, it's no coincidence they've won so many kind of Champions League titles, European Cups over the years. It's because as a club, no matter who's playing for that team, you always sense that they're going to be there or thereabouts. They're going to stay in big games because I think that there's an energy that comes from the supporter being a Real Madrid player and knowing the history of the club. And I think that kind of, that that, that speaks for a lot when you go into a final of a, of a European competition and one that they've been in so often and been successful in so often. So, yeah, I totally agree. I don't think it's going to be, be an easy game for Liverpool. I know people are saying they're favourites, but I, I see this game going right into the early hours, possibly a penalty shootout. And like you mentioned there, some of the players Real Madrid have, they, they may be getting on in kind the years, but they still got like quality Benzema straight away comes comes to mind. The goal, his goal scoring record this year has been um phenomenal. Like and yeah, Modric, Tony Cruz, there's still players there that can on any given moment in a game can kind of change the game. So now it's I think it's going to be a, a really tough game, and I think it'll be tight. And I do I expect it to go right into the early hours. And listen, I'd love Liverpool to win it because I think even achieving a treble and in, in, in kind of in the in the game the way it is at the moment the quality around would be an unbelievable achievement but no I, I just think it, it could go any way and Real Madrid will be kind of licking the lips for this game because they'll be liking the fact that nobody really expects them to win it they will be wanting to prove prove everybody wrong to say, say we're Real Madrid we're still this kind of big team that listen we, we're in this final for a reason and the fact that they're still in the competition tells you tells you everything about them like they, they look like you were going out on many occasions obviously the Chelsea game the City game and they just keep rolling their sleeves up and, and, and kind of finding a way to get the job done. And again, I don't think it'll be any different come Saturday. 
Yeah, and Gary, Liverpool have won two trophies so far. Um, if they don't win on Saturday and the great season they've had in running Man City so close, there will be a sense of disappointment all around. Absolutely. I think, you know, it's, the FA Cup is great and the League Cup, you know, not so much. I think to take or leave it, but Champions League and Premier League is what they want to be winning. That's what their focus will be at the start of the season. So, look, I think anytime you're in the, in the final, especially a Champions League final, it'll be a huge disappointment if you don't come out on the right side of the results. And, and like the lads have said, I think Miguel may give us a preview of some of the, some of the pages, uh, the back pages coming up over the next few days with speculation around top players possibly going to Real Madrid. But, like Real Madrid and the history of that club and you know the way they've gone about their business. I think there'll be a lot of people who feel that their name is written on the trophy, you know, you know, to go and get the results they've had and they've had backs to the walls and it looked like they were going out with a few minutes to go on, on, on numerous occasions. I think they are really, really dangerous. And you look at the players and the quality they have, although they're kind of an aging squad, Benzema with 15 goals this year, Modric and the likes, they've got real quality. I think if Liverpool um the energy that Liverpool have in 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 in, um, in their press, and if they can win the ball in dangerous areas and punish them, it's about taking their chances in finals. And if they if they have you know, that conviction, and when they get their chances, they take them. I think they will win the game. But if Real Madrid can stay in the game, it'll be very very dangerous for Liverpool because they have that know how, they have that history, and they have seriously qual- serious quality players who who may feel it's their last opportunity to 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 win a Champions League final as well. So. I'm really looking forward to the game. I think it's going to be a terrific game. There's loads of different permutations at play. And I just think it's one that, you know, the, the knockout games in the Champions League are terrific occasions. And, you know, they've coughed up spectacular games in the semi-finals, quarter-finals, the whole way through the competition. And uh, I really hope that the final lives up to that expectation. Just, just one thing on Dan, that, Gary, I was thinking, as you were saying, uh, I completely agree, obviously, on, on Madrid and their history in the competition but the, the one different thing about this game in comparison to all the clubs they've played in the knockout is that they're, they're playing a team with at least almost as close to a history as they do because I mean to my mind in in the, in the knockout game so far I think as much there is much about the opposition as Madrid I mean Paris Saint-Germain and City for, for all their money their history of the Champions League is really is failure so when it came right down to it I think in the opposite way, what happened to Madrid, who just believe they win this competition, something took over the Paris Saint Germain and City players, especially when they conceded. And obviously, Chelsea were just going, even though they were European champions, they were going through all this uncertainty with the owner and, and, and even the future of the club. Whereas Liverpool, like I think there's a stat, this is the final that's had more European cups than any other. Like Madrid have 13, Liverpool have six. Um, so, uh, and as we've seen from Liverpool in Europe, mo- most prominently the Barcelona game three years ago, they're almost like Madrid. And, and certainly Klopp has um, has used that history in the same way that Ancelotti has done this season in terms of creating just this belief that no matter the circumstance in the team, they can get through this. I think that's maybe, that, that's just an extra challenge for Madrid in that regard, or, or certainly maybe kind of balances out one of their main qualities in the final, or in the run this season. Yeah, so Liverpool sort of insulated by history, as you say there. But Stephen, even with that, do they seem a little bit more vulnerable in the last few weeks? I'm thinking the Villarreal game where, obviously, look, they staged a comeback in the end. But then um, there was also the Aston Villa game where Aston Villa pushed them. But I think, again, there were a few selection calls there that obviously affected the the balance of the team. But um, you also look at, say, Vinicius's pace in behind that space, behind Trent Alexander-Arnold. Did they just Do Liverpool just seem a little bit Slightly vulnerable, obviously still his favourites. Yeah, so Liverpool have, have been haven't been as free flowing in recent weeks. You, yeah, you only have to look at kind of Virgil Van Dijk. Is he going to be fully fit? You know what I mean? He picked up an injury there a few weeks ago. He might be struggling. Salah hasn't been in great form, and he's usually like in the big games the go-to player for um for Liverpool. I know he scored a weekend, and that might do him the world of good kind of achieving that goal uh, golden boot in the Premier League because it, it was looking like at a stage in the weekend where he wasn't going to get on that. You're looking at him and his character, you think things like that matter to him. So me, he might have that little bit of an edge to his game on the weekend, which could be a good thing for Liverpool. But yeah, no, it's it's going to be, as I said before, it's, I, I see it being a very tight game. 
everybody knows, like you mentioned there, how, how good Trent Alexander is going forward. He's probably one of the best kind of distributors of the ball in, in, in European football. He, he's fantastic going forward. He's, his delivery is second to none. But again, he sometimes does leave that little bit of space behind, which somebody with the pace of a Susius, then he, he might might upset Liverpool, uh, up Liverpool. But no, it's it's going to be it's going to be a very intriguing watch. Like, like Miguel said there, what's a 19 Champions Leagues between the two of them, 19 European Cup. It's, it's a phenomenal game. It's a fixture that like gets everybody kind of standing up and excited. And obviously the last game we played, the, we already mentioned the Salah incident. It's it's a great game. It's a great fixture. Two of the biggest clubs in the world. And again, I just can't wait to watch it. And whoever wins will deserve it on the day because they'll get the job done. Yeah. And one final point before we start, we talk about the Ireland squad and it relates to your article in the Independent at the weekend, uh, Miguel, for people who are looking for it, it's on the independent.co.uk. So the, the, the Kylian Mbappe saga and how football became a plaything for nation states. Um, this obviously relates to Mbappe staying at PSG, turning down Real Madrid, which is, again, a traditional giant being turned down by a, uh, a club that is backed by a nation state. And it, this also ties into Holland joining Manchester City. Similar dynamic again, because normally a player like that would have been going to a Barcelona, Real Madrid in a previous era. Um, just in the piece itself, I did enjoy the kind of uh, the succession reference, obviously Logan Roy and an angry uh, Florentino Perez. So um, I don't think people will feel too sorry for him. But when you look at the concerns now in the long term for what this means for the game, um, how worrying is it? And what can be done? What like does, does UEFA have an answer to this? Obviously, they put a stop to the, the Super League, which I think everyone was relieved at. But that doesn't really answer all the questions in terms of equality within the game. So, well, that's a great frustration. And, and like some of the conversation we've been talking about, we've already had touches into this, where say a club like Sunderland, who Stephen obviously knows well, um, and I haven't played for them and, 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 and been a hero of the club. Um, like, that's a club where well, a regular sport of 40,000 people and just it's a, a, a traditional power in England and just completely should have already kind of a, a few tiers down whatever about like where they are currently in the league even when they were in the Premier League they were just part of this kind of it, 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 it's this system now in football with constant ceilings and the Super League given that for basically for, for 30 years all the big clubs had used the threat of a Super League to get everything their own way so say an a, a, Perfect example of that and how, how football has become so kind of unequal. Because of the way the big clubs managed to influence how Champions League prize money is given out. So say where you're not given money for the season you qualify, you're given money for 10 years performance. So let's say at the end of last season, it was Chelsea and Leicester going for the top four. Had Leicester got, it, got into it, they would have been guaranteed just under 2 million from qualifying. Had Chelsea got in, which they did, they were guaranteed 30 million. So that already, and this, this is a world that Real Madrid have created. So it, it's why it's kind of difficult to have too much sympathy for them. But with the, with the failure of the Super League last year, it was a chance for UEFA to challenge this. But what actually happened? They didn't challenge, they didn't kind of address this at all. It's, it's arguably got worse now, where they've created this monster of a Champions League. Uh, the Paris Saint-Germain president, Nasser Al-Khalafi, used the situation to, to actually ensure he's now one of the most powerful people in European football. He's risen up the ECA. People are talking about him as a future president of UEFA. And while that financial inequality has always been a, a, an issue in football, certainly for the last 30 years with kind of various financial changes, clubs floating in the stock market, all of that. Um, and it, it, was, it was a situation that Madrid and Barcelona dominated more than anyone else. They, were, they always had the pick really of the best clubs. But there were more challenges. I think, and that's the real issue here. It's not so much that financial inequality is anything new. It's that it's getting worse and worse and the top end is getting narrowing. I mean, like what, what ultimately happened with Mbappe? I mean, because, because a week ago, everyone was saying it was inevitable that he was going to Madrid. It was done deal. Then he goes to Qatar for a week. Qatar, we're hosting the World Cup, another angle of this, owners of PSG. And he gets the absolute hard sell. He's got the Emir of Qatar onto him. Does he, it was even kind of, um, it was even revealed yesterday that he had Sarkozy and Macron. Uh, and let, let's not forget, there's a very strong relationship between Qatar and France now. Um, Sarkozy and Macron onto him to stay, which actually just, <laughs> as John was saying, it reminded of, of, of Bertie getting involved with Saipan. Um, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> on another level, maybe. Uh, and ultimately, they basically, they, they've, they've given Mbappe the biggest offer that any player has ever seen. And, and, and I think what's worrying for me in that regard is that we were basically in a situation 
where it would have been better for football's variety and its market if a top player had gone to Madrid. Now, even to say that is actually ridiculous given Madrid's traditional power. But but that is the problem. And you can see we're like... So and ultimately, as, as, as you've seen over the past two weeks, what's happened is the two next best players in the world are many people... Well, Mbappe may be the best now. Many people would say Haaland up there. Well, they've both gone to these state-owned projects in, in City... And, uh, and Paris Saint-Germain. And, and, it, and now that uh, financial fair play has been changed, um, we are potentially in a world where they can just make these offers. That, that's a worry, for it, at least in terms of uh, competitive balance. France, I mean, gee, like, <laughs> how, many, how many titles are Paris Saint-Germain, Paris Saint-Germain going to win? And, mm-hmm. and, and that would be my concern. And it, do, it doesn't feel like there's much of an attempt to, to regulate. I mean, because UEFA's role should be basically safeguarding and protecting the, the competitive balance of football, to make it, at the very least, as equal a playing field as possible. But instead, it feels like we're going the opposite direction. And, um, and again, it's why a lot of people in Madrid going into this final, they're kind, of, they're kind of worrying. A little bit like Milan when they played Liverpool in 2007 and haven't been near a Champions League final yet. It's, it could be a bit of a last hurrah for these big clubs in their modern forms because they can see which way uh, things are going. Yeah, it does seem fairly bleak, um, which is a good time to turn around and talk about the Ireland squad. So, Miguel, I know you're fairly busy, so I'm going to let you go. And I know, Jim, I think you're a man in demand. You've got another, we've got about two or three calls now coming up. So, uh, we might let both of you go. But look, thanks a million for taking the time. Champions League final, RT2, RT player, um, this Saturday from seven o'clock. And also, we'll have a load of coverage online as well. We're going to talk about the Ireland squad now. And there are Nations League games coming up in June. They're going to be on RT2 and the RT player. We're also going to have radio and online coverage as well. And then the same for the Euro 2024 qualifiers, which are still obviously a good bit away. But um, there are four games coming up at the start of June. So a packed schedule. Uh, Stephen Kenny was on the Late Late Show last Friday. Let's have a listen to how he's looking forward to these games. This is, you know, it's very exciting for us, first of all. Uh, in the next week we're, we're in camp the players love coming into camp together Good. there's a tremendous spirit tremendous camaraderie real uh, real sense of origins they're very proud to play for the country yeah. and all of a sudden now we're, we're together for, for 18 days uh, which is unusual for us because the camps are normally shorter so in those 10 days we go to uh, we go to Armenia which is a 7 hour trip uh, uh, through time zones we come back and play the Ukraine in the Aviva, which would be a magical occasion mm. playing the Ukraine in the current circumstances. Mm-hmm. Then we play Scotland three days later and then we're back again to play uh, Ukraine away. It's in Poland. So yes. those four games with the, with the flights in, in, in 10 days. So it's a real intense period, but it's, it's going to be a special period as well for, for the player. I don't know how much they're looking forward to it. They're, they're all with different clubs and they'll always be with clubs in their careers, but they'll always be Irish and they're very, very proud to be Irish yes. and they're, they're a pleasure to manage. So that's Ireland manager Stephen Kenny looking ahead to the Nations League games. As I said, Armenia, Ukraine and Scotland in, the, uh, in our group. So um, one thing um, I think that he really emphasised there was the 18 days together and it takes us back to last summer, there were friendlies against Andorra and Hungary. And I think that was a crucial period, wasn't it, Gary, in terms of having time with the players. Obviously, you've worked, you've, you know, you've been coached by Stephen Kenny, you've worked with him and there's a lot he can get across, uh, especially to any one or any of the one or two uh, incoming players that, uh, you know, haven't been part of recent squads. Yeah, I think Stephen really has a, a massive emphasis on that. Even, you know, as Dundalk manager, mid-season is generally a time where there's a, there's a couple of weeks off. And But Stephen, you know, you get two or three days off and you'd be into a camp, you generally go to a camp. And it's really where he kind of does his best work. And, you know, he would have gelled that group in, like people would have been looking at that, the Andorra game, um, that time and going over to Barcelona into a camp and be questioning, you know, the, the methodology behind it. But Stephen really enjoys that getting getting in around the players and like uh, he it's well documented his man management style and stuff like that so just getting to know the characters within the group and they've gone on to build from there which is no great surprise and he'll be looking at this nation's league campaign and um, having 18 days in camp he'll probably go for probably a slightly extended squad maybe for, for you know to, to cover the the four fixtures and the, the, the balance of this squad though is it, difficult to gauge because you've guys who were playing league one football you've guys who are playing scotland and they all finished in different times. So it's just kind of getting the right blend. Obviously, there's some players who, who didn't have enough of a minute. So it'd be interesting to see what squad he put together. But he, he'd be delighted to have 18 days with them and plenty of football to look forward to. 
Um, he, he's very methodical in, in his preparation and um, it'll, be, it'll be, I suppose, Stephen's mindset going into this, it'll be to try and, try and win all the games and try and get up um, into the, the next bracket in the Nations League, you know, to improve the chances of, of being seeded for, for qualifications down the line. Yeah, and Stephen, it doesn't look like it's going to be any, there's, the transition in a sense is over um, towards the end of the last campaign and then um, with those March friendly. So the only player, I think, outside of the main core group that, you know, would be of a relatively high profile that will come in would probably be Michael Abafemi at Swansea, finished the season with 12 goals in his last 16 games in great form. Obviously, his situation is a little bit different because he did turn down a call up in March for, well, more, more so for fitness reasons. Um do you expect him to get a call up? And also, how do you think he'll be eased in? Because it's Kenny's style doesn't seem to be to throw players straight into the team. There's a kind of adaptation process that's needed. Yeah, I, I, listen, you mentioned his form there. He, he probably probably should be kind of in the squad. I'd be surprised if he isn't. But I think that's a strength. I think, Steve and Kenny, I think like, like, uh, like Gary mentioned there, he'll know better than I do. I haven't worked with him for so many years, but I think this is one of these big strengths, Steve, and like of, of kind of bringing a group together and, and getting everybody like the fact, like I know we spoke earlier on in the podcast about how, how Irish players aren't getting so many minutes in, in the kind of top levels in the Premier League, but I think that's something that Stephen Kenny won't be too kind of worried about because I think he's all about kind of building a bond with these players, finding a bond on the pitch, off the pitch together, finding a style where whoever he has to put in the team, whether that's that's somebody that's playing in League One in the in the Scot in the SBL in Scotland or the or the Championship, then it's. It, it doesn't really matter because everybody knows what's required of them. And I think that's a that's been a really big strength. And listen, st- managers have certain strengths and certain weaknesses. And I think Stephen is looking forward to this. I think he embraces having the lads for 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 a long time because, it, like he mentioned, there, it's very unusual to have players for more than a week in international football nowadays, especially with, like we say, our players playing in different levels. But I think it's an exciting time. I think it's the fact that there's four games coming up and. Uh, listen, off the back of some good results, some really good performances, there's a massive improvement there. And I think everybody's excited. Like Irish supporters are excited to see what the future holds. And I think these games will uh, be a real kind of telltale sign whether the lads have continued this on, like from whether they can back up like some top performances, the likes of like certain players that have come in and and, and you kind of didn't know too much about them. And now they're coming in and all of a sudden they're kind of mainstays in the Ireland team and the Ireland squad. I know there's some players that aren't really getting much game time at clubs now where you're thinking would have been like permanent, like the likes of Jeff Henrik, for example, he 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 would have been a permanent fixture, still is a little bit in the Ireland squad, but he's hardly played. He's went to QPR, he's not not played regularly. And it's it's interesting whether whether Stephen can kind of get the balance right with the players that are playing regularly at whatever level they're playing or those who are not playing. But I think the fact that there's 18 days to get some good training into the players that may not be be getting minutes and Again, it's a, it is. It's been it's been really good to watch it. One thing I will say about the Ireland Ireland performance of late, anybody that's come in, they, 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 they seem like they're playing with no fear. Although they're playing at the national football, I think they're playing and they just go out and play as if it's just a, another game of football. And I think credit has to be given to Stephen Kenny for that because he's he's created an environment there. It seems that players are just happy to play. Brian, he mentioned there on the late late show about how players are excited to kind of come into the squad, and and that wasn't always the case. I remember certain players sometimes used to look at the kind of international, no, no friendlies end the season friendlies, and they're kind of. Oh, I know obviously the nation leagues has changed that a little bit, but like players be like end the season, long season, just want to go away with their families on holidays, have a mental break. But he he, he reckons all the lads are excited to come in, and that's probably. He's created that buzz of playing for Ireland again. It, it's the biggest thing in the world. Like, like I like the way Stephen speaks. He says, "Listen, players are always going to be at different clubs, but you're always going to be Irish." And and that's his mindset. And you can just set, you can tell his passion from that. And that's ultimately probably his biggest strength. That, that passion he has of being Irish and creating that kind of unity in the squad and, and letting players realise what it's like to represent your country. And I think it, the last few games we've seen that with players, young players coming in and playing like they've had 30, 40 caps and long may it continue because I do listen we're, we're probably not going to have players playing in the near future in the top levels of the Premier League that's just the way football's going Midwell's already talked about the financial situation of the powerhouses at the at the top end so we got to find a way to compete with um with teams on, on a European scale on a world scale international football that not letting we kind of got to bridge that gap in other ways and, and Stephen did that in Dundalk and that's probably partly the reason why he's he's got the manager's job because he was able to compete with teams in Europe with bigger budgets kind of so-called better players on um 
on opposition teams. So and that's that's something that maybe that's probably that's probably the main reason why he's got this job. And we gotta we gotta get behind them now. And he's, he's he's signed his new deal. And again, it's exciting time because I'm sure all the lads are looking forward. To it. There's nothing better than playing for your country. And I think that that was forgotten a little bit with certain players in recent times. Yeah, and a final point just on the squad before we move on to the League of Ireland. So um, in terms of Matt Doherty's injury. That does oh, that does um, change the dynamic a little bit. I wonder is Seamus Seamus Coleman's obviously thrived in this uh, right at the back three um, rather than a wing back um, in more recent times. So I don't know, like in terms of getting Nathan Collins onto the pitch as well, because he seems to have really adapted to the Premier League. Mm-hmm. How do you think Stephen Kenny's going to manage that, Stephen? I, I, listen, if, if, you, if we haven't got Matt Doherty, it's a big loss because I think everybody's seeing how, how well he performed under Conte. He's found another spring in his step. And because at that time, people were wondering whether his time at Spurs may have kind of come to a quick end. But now he's, he's, he's all of a sudden become a really important player for Spurs, probably one of their main players under, under Conte's style. And again, that coincided with good performances for Ireland in, in that, that position. But yeah, I think with those options there, you mentioned Nathan Collins. He's come into Borne, albeit they've been relegated. He's, he's got a lot of bags of experience. He looks a really good prospects so I think there'll be opportunities there for players and as I said there's four games so I'm sure we'll see a lot of changes in the games and Stephen kind of integrating certain players in different positions and there'll be a good eye opener for Stephen to see who can kind of cope with playing playing international football but I don't think he'd be too worried listen he, he knows his squad he, he does his homework well he's got players he's got people watching watching players all over kind of the the, the English leagues and, and Irish leagues Scottish leagues he, he does his due diligence on players and again I, I wouldn't be too worried I'm sure he has a, has a plan and, and again it's a long time he's got to spend with these players I'm sure he'll walk on certain things and train and have a look at players and, and kind of practice matches and see whether they could be could be an option in, in different positions but no it's I think the future is bright it's exciting time there's Listen, there's no superstars in this island squad, but there's definitely a bond there in the unity and everybody seems to have a smile on their face when they're playing now and that can only bode well for the future. Yeah, so those games coming up in June and the squad to be named any day now. But um, we're going to talk League of Ireland now. And uh, before we get to the two rounds of action from Friday and Monday, there was the issue of match fixing that came up last week. So last week, 10 men aged between 20 and 60 were arrested in morning raids and they included LOI players and officials. It's part of Operation Brookweed, an investigation into alleged match, match fixing, which is being led by the Gardaí Chicana Anti-Bribery and Corruption Unit. It began three years ago following reports of suspected match fixing from the FAI and UEFA. All 10 men have been subsequently released. We might just listen to Shamrock Rovers manager Stephen Bradley. He was speaking to RT Sports' Adrian Eames after Rovers' 3-0 win over UCD and his reaction to the events of last week. Away from this particular match, the news this week, obviously there's been a lot of good news stories around the League of Ireland in terms of crowd attendance. There's a good buzz about the league, some great games. But the news this week, several people brought in for questioning about match fixing dating back a couple of years ago. Not a good look for the league. No, of course not. And if uh, if anyone's found uh, guilty, um, they should uh, face severe punishment. Um, we don't need that in any sport. We definitely don't need it in football, and we don't want that. So, um, like I said, um, if anyone's found guilty, there should be uh, severe punishment. It's tough for the league, though, because people are, are doing their best. There's so many people volunteering around the league, so many people trying to lift the standards. And, and this kind of story, it's not good news for, for people who are looking in from outside. No, it's not. But um, I think we've got to uh, understand that it's an isolated incident. Um, and and um, the league is really progressing. It's really doing well. Uh, standard football is really good. Crowds are up. Um, there's going to be investment in, in stadiums over the next few years. Uh, there's a lot of positive, a lot more positive news than negative news uh, regarding the league. But like you said, it's something that we don't want and we don't need. Thanks, Stephen. Thank Cheers. Thanks, Thanks Stephen. very much. Thanks. Okay, that is Shamrock Rovers manager Stephen Bradley. Um, Gary, a couple of points there. Uh, we react to just the last part of what Stephen Bradley said uh, very shortly. But first, um, in your own time as a player, have you ever um, set foot on a field and been kind of suspicious of uh, what's kind of going on around you? No, I think when you step on the pitch, it's, it's not something that you'd be thinking about and certainly not something that you'd hope is taking place. Um, obviously, look, the situation that, that's been talked about uh, now, it, it, is, it is a stain on our league and it's not what you want to be reading about and listening to and looking around the news because I think our, our league struggles for, for media attention or positive media attention and there is all sorts of problems within the league that, that need addressing and, and this just doesn't paint it in a good light and Stephen Bradley obviously was keen to to focus on the standard of football in the league rather than what, what he described as an isolated incident. We don't know how isolated the incident is. Obviously, there is an investigation going on and we would hope that 
that investigation gets uh, gets uh, resolved and and if if there's a case that is match fixing uh, going on there is people um, to blame that you know that the that they they are are punished and they, you know to make it you know I suppose to set an example and to make sure that it, you know that, that that sort of behavior isn't condoned and it deters people from from taking part in in, in such behavior so look it, it's um it's not what we want to be reading about our league like I said it, it's a case that you know, the league struggles for positive um, news, if you like. You know, I know there's been really good European runs and there's a, a tremendous standard of football and the, the 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 crowds that are going to games now, it, it, you know, it, it's been brilliant. I was at a game last night on a Monday night and, and the place was jammed. So, like, there's lots of positives going on in the league, but unfortunately, you know, it's the, it's the negative that will make the, the, the headlines. Yeah, and as you said, it is a stain on the game if match fixing is taking place within it. And as you said, Stephen Bradley was focusing on the positives. In the medium term, long term, how do you think this story um, will affect the image of the league? Yeah, look, it, it's not good. I think, you know, it's one of those things, you, you, there'll be headlines for a few days. You have to wait and see what, what you know, the investigation uncovers and, and where it goes. But you know, anytime, anytime there's more news on it, it will be highlighted. So, look in, in the short term, short to medium term, it's not going to be an attractive look. We'd be hoping that, you know, the the Irish team in the Nations League football takes over the headlines over over the next eighteen to uh, to, to three weeks. Um, so that that would be more of a uh, what we'd be looking at. We want to be talking about football and and certainly not about match fixing. Yeah, so Stephen Bradley, when he was speaking there, he was speaking after Shamrock Rovers beat UCD 3-0, but then Fortunes would turn uh, a few days later. So that game was on Thursday. And then Bohemians uh, beat Sligo Rovers 2-1 um, on Friday. Drada United in a big win for them, 3-1 against a struggling Finn Harps. St. Pat's lost 2-1 at home to Shelburne, who are on a roll now. And we're going to win on Monday again, as we're going to see Derry City a setback for them, losing 2-1 at home to Dundalk. And then on Monday, uh, Finn Harps lost 1-0 at home to Dundalk, who again are in good form. Draw the United uh, beat Shamrock Rovers 1-0. Shock result there. Sligo Rovers beat Derry City 2-1. So Derry City's form continuing to struggle. Obviously, Sligo Rovers, as we're going to talk about very shortly, um, searching for a new manager. And then Shelburne 2, UCD 0. St. Pat's 3, Bohemians 0. As I said, we're going to touch on Sligo Rovers. And I think that's probably the place to uh, to be. So they got a really good win over Derry City, who we'll also talk about very shortly. But um, Liam Buckley leaves the club by mutual consent. How surprised were you, Barry? Um, not particularly surprised. I think you know, there was, I suppose, rumblings last year, later on the season, with the bad run that they went on, that, um, that you know things weren't all plain sailing there but in fairness to Liam he turned it around and managed to qualify for Europe again so like I think Liam can hold his head up high in terms of the job that he's done in Sligo he's qualified for Europe twice didn't get the rub of the green in Europe last year had a lot of injuries and had COVID issues around um, John Mann and Johnny Kenny around that time and Greg Bulger was sent off in the first game and that probably would have cost them you know qualifying for around the Europe which as we know is very lucrative for League of Ireland clubs so I think Liam you know maybe they felt it was a time to change and both both sides, as I said, it was, it was uh, mutual consent. So both parties obviously felt that a change was needed. So um, obviously <clears throat> John Russell took took the reins last night and John's been there for a number of years, a really, really good coach um, and, you know, got, got them off to, you know, a really good result against a, a strong Derry City side. So John has probably done himself no harm. Um, I'm sure he's probably would be, we are one of the candidates that would be looking looking for the job amongst others like i'm sure there's a host of, like it's a very attractive job it's a full-time job it's a great club to play for and it'd be a great club to manage i'm sure like the likes of danny ventry who's been at blackpool for six years and and there's lots of players like jason mcginnis and gavin Pierce and all these guys that would have played at the club and they were now i suppose you know in coaching various coaching roles out, outside of um outside the game now so uh, so they, there's lots of kind of guys that will be will be looking for it so it's a it's a very attractive prospect you know to, to be uh, to get the slider over job yeah John Russell who was speaking to Eric White at the BBC afterwards he was sort of playing it he was you know he kind of show, he, he did speak of sort of where he's hinting at interest but also obviously he's playing it down um, at the same time so yeah it was a great win for them um, as they go in search of a manager now and uh for Pats as well, it's sort of Jekyll and Hyde. So they lose at home to Shelburne on the Friday and then, um, you know, they, they bounce back with a victory over Bowes on Monday. Um, and it's 
second win in six for Pats now. And um, we're seeing two sides of them, basically, you know, because uh, Tim Clancy, after the Friday game, he was very concerned about the defensive aspect, which has been uh, something that has been an underlying issue for the club over the last while, Gary. Yeah, and look, I was at the game last night and, you know, an eyeing in the goal for, for Pat, you know, was on loan from West Ham was terrific in the second, in the first half particularly. I think, you know, St. Pat's punished an error at the back to the maximum with Tunde get, getting the first goal early and Pat's really scored at the optimum times. They scored early. They weathered a massive storm from Bohemians. Bohemians would be wondering how they didn't equalise. But, they, you know, an eyeing, like I said, made some really good saves. But then Tunde gets the goal in the 46 minutes. So all of a sudden, where Bowes are going in one nil down, they're all of a sudden two nil down. And, it, you know, there's a massive change. And really, Bowes didn't offer a whole lot in the second half. And uh, Doyle was clumsily taken down for, for a penalty. And it was 3 nil and, and, and Pats were home and hose. So, like, Tim may be concerned. Obviously, you know, he's a young, young player playing right back. Uh, Sam Curtis, only 16, was terrific on the night. He's made three or four appearances there. Watched his debut against Rotten United a couple of weeks back. He was excellent, um, and he's really slotted into senior football really well. Like Pats are, are a kind of um, a team that are evolving, and there's a lots of young players. They've got some senior, like Jamie Lennon has been out injured, Paddy Barrow has been injured, so there's been lots of changes there with Robbie Benson and John Mountley leaving the club as well. So they're a work in progress. Um, I don't think there'd be any need to be sending alarm bells just on a yes, but you know they're bringing through terrific talent through their academy, and you know when you're bringing through young players, you're not going to get that consistency in performances. That, and that's why there is a massive degree in, in differences in their performance. Like they go from the Shelburne game where they were poor, they go to the Bowes game where you know, they, the result would be the 3-0. It probably wasn't a 3-0 game. Wasn't, it wouldn't be a good reflection on Bowes. Like they really had chances in, in that first half and could have easily got a couple of goals. But you know, it was a tremendous result for St. Pat. Derry City, now it's a run of five games without a win and uh, three defeats on the trot. But... As Rory Higgins said, he would have been quite happy with the overall performances in the four games uh, prior to the defeat to Sligo Rovers. But uh, he described last night's game as the worst performance of the season so far. And he does admit they're sort of in a difficult moment. Yeah, I think he look, he'll obviously be disappointed with the run they're on. I think, you know, the defeat against Shamrock Rovers, they played really well. I think most of the anyone that would have seen that game knew that they, they you know, the quality that they had and the likes of patching in midfield and you know, they really, I suppose, probably should have got something out of the game. Um, obviously, Dundalk would be a tough game and, and Dundalk went up to, to Derry and getting the win when they hadn't won an, an away game all season was a, was a big result for Dundalk and another disappointing one for Derry. But last night, I think, you know, he, he's particularly disappointed with the performance. I don't think he could question the performance in, in the previous two defeats. So, like, I think Derry just need to, I suppose, get to the break and try and pick up a win before that and then, you know, reevaluate where they're at. Because in fairness to Derry, they've played terrific football this year, but they have suffered some serious injuries and to key players like the McElhenney and Duffy, you know, they would have been key signings for Rory Higgins at the start of the season. And, you know, to lose players of that quality, you know, it, it's okay to kind of, um, I suppose, to get by for a few few games. And obviously they've lost Harkin as well, but when you're losing them for long periods, that does tell over a long periods of time when, when you lose this quality. So they need to just kind of, get themselves back on the horse, pick up a win and regroup down over the break. So Stephen, I know you probably keep an eye on Drada United as a, as a former player, but you know, that's two huge wins for them um, against Finn Harps first, which was more uh, a battle closer to where they are on the table. And then to go and follow it up uh, three days later to beat the cham- champion Shamrock Rovers unexpectedly, huge, huge win for uh, Kevin Doherty and his team. Yeah, it was it was a great couple a uh, great couple of games for Kevin. He'd be delighted, obviously beating beating Finn Harps is a big one. They're the teams if you want to kind of stay in the division and kind of keep your head above water. They're the teams you got to be beating and around you. But to to go and get the bonus of beating Shamrock Rovers was was special. And obviously Ryan Brennan, he's a really good player. He, he's proven his worth over the years. Scored some really important goals for various clubs. And Kevin will be dying. and that that will fill the squad with confidence going forward. Obviously. Nobody, like you said, nobody would have expected that last night. So there's def- there's definitely quality amongst the squad. And Kevin's a good manager. He's very, very good. Obviously, I worked with Kevin briefly at Shelbourne as well when he was manager there. He's a really good fella and he- he's very passionate about his job. And he'll he'll be feeling very good about himself this morning. And obviously hoping that this will kick on the the draw of the lads to try and pick up some more big results in the in the near future.
Yeah, and Gary, from the Shamrock Rovers' point of view, of course, um, Stephen Bradley, I would imagine, would be furious with the result. Um, now, the only mitigating thing, of course, Derry City being in poor form probably gives them a bit of a window. But at the same time, um, is it almost, it's maybe not the worst result for them. It just kind of reminds them that they have to be up to a certain standard. Obviously, they, they lost Jack Byrne to injury and uh, there was the red card towards the end. But still, um, is it something that he can kind of use as a stick to beat his own team with? Hey, look, he'd be disappointed. I think the, the person he'd be most disappointed with the result would be Rory Higgins because that was an opportunity to close the ground after dropping it in them a massive favour. Um, look, I think, you know, like you said, it, it's one of those things that, you know, you can't take, I'm not saying that they took them for granted, but there's no easy games and anybody on the day is, is capable of beating you. Kevin Doherty will be delighted because I know that Kevin would have lost a few bodies and the, like the Andrew Quinn and Sean Rohan were, were out for that game. So, like, they were down bodies themselves. I think oftentimes we don't look at, I suppose, you know, the struggles for, for Drottlers have come up with two two really good results. You know, they're going to lose games this season, but to go and be Finn Harps, like Stephen said, the team around them, and then to, to beat Shamrock Rovers, who are top of the table, it's been a really good good week for them. If they can finish strong now and pick up another win before the break, they'll be really happy with, with, with their business so far. But, look, Shamrock Rovers, I think, you know, yes, they'll absolutely be disappointed with, with not picking up three points. But like I think the grand scheme of things, Derry weren't able to capitalise on, on, on that mistake. And more often than not, Sean McRovers are, go, are going to pick up points. I think they'll, they'll be, still be very strong favourites to, to win the league. And over the whole season, I, I don't think it'll it'll have that much of an effect on it. I think, you know, you look, you'd be more worried about the players that they would have lost for injury. Danny Landry getting sent off, obviously not ideal. But Jack um, struggling with an injury and uh, having to come off, they'd be, they'd be more worried about getting these players peaking for Europe because I think I think they'll win the league and um, but Europe is is probably the reason why Stephen Bradley is still here. And you know, you know, in order to do that, you know, they've got really got to be firing on all cylinders. So like, you know, a defeat against Rotterdam doesn't show that they're they're really at the top of their game yet, but they need to build towards uh, their European campaign. Yeah, and just as we talk about that, Dundalk have and now we've been Dundalk have been getting a lot of praise on this podcast over recent weeks, but suddenly they put themselves into the conversation for second place again, win their game in hand, and they actually go above Derry City, and that's a massive closing of the gap. Um, there, um, someone I wanted to talk about as part of that was Robbie Benson as well, because a few couple of weeks ago he scored. Uh, he was at the end of basically a beautiful team goal that was uh, created, and then scored again on Friday. Um, just individually and then as a collective uh what's Stephen O'Donnell done there yeah look I think it's good to be talking about Dundalk and not uh, <laughs> referring back to you know, the, the off the off the pitch mayhem that had been there for the last couple of years so it's it's a massive positive you know the club is in, in really good place obviously Stephen O'Donnell has come in really familiar with you know the owners the club the fans and it's been good to see I suppose you know a turnaround in, in the way things have been done there like you know, Stephen would have identified Robbie Benson as a key player, and, and John Mountley. He brought both of them from St Pat's. They were they were massive in the St Pat's dressing room last year, and and they're really good, um, people in in any dressing room, and, and they kind of set the tone and dictate the standards. And they were key uh, players that that Stephen would have added to. Like you know, Stephen in terms of his football brain and his his knowledge, he would have spent plenty of time obviously as a as a player in the league in the dark but would have worked under Stephen Kenny as opposition analyst you know which is a role that both himself and Rory Higgins did, um, you know done when they had finished playing so they would have uh, they would have learned a lot in that kind of role and you know, Stephen has taken all this information in he's building a really nice squad I, look, they're not title challengers I think he'll be the first to tell you that and um, they'd be really happy with how it's going but it's a case of when they, they hadn't won in a way game uh, up until last week and now they've won back-to-back away games so that's been the difference the home form has been really good and if they can start to put away form together I, I think European football is, is definitely where they'll be at this year whether they have enough to sustain a, a title challenge I don't believe so right now but I think you know that will be the end goal for them Stephen will be looking at building and adding more players possibly in, in the summer that will make sure that they're, they're, they're competing at the right end of the table and it's a longer term project. It's, it's not about this season, it's about the following season, the year after that, to, to get Dundalk back uh, really as, as, as title contenders. 
yeah, we'll talk about Shelburne and their four wins in a row now very, very shortly. But before that, Finn Harps, of course, struggling at the wrong end and just in a just kind of stuck in a rut at the moment. And it also comes in a week when they've just had an update in regards to the stadium. So the target in terms of moving into it is 2024 and it's revised in order to reduce costs as well. So the venue uh, capacity is going to be 3,300, which is 50 percent down on the original Um in terms of them on and off the pitch now, um, obviously survival will be key um, in terms of, you know, uh, I suppose, uh, mitigating any kind of stadium costs and everything as well. But um, how do they get out of this, uh, Gary? Um, I, I look, I think they're probably fortunate is that UCD will look like they will go down. Um, I don't think, you know, there's anybody who would put up a major argument against that. And, like they, they probably look, they've lost Colin Whelan to injury. They probably look set to lose Kerrigan, one of their better players in the summer, to 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 maybe some of the top clubs here or maybe in the UK. So, like it's going to be a real tough struggle for UCD. So that in itself will uh, will help Finn Harps. I think, you know, Finn Harps in a playoff are a formidable opposition and they have that know how and they have got quality and they like they like to Barry McNamee and then Brian Connolly. Like they have got quality there. So, but I do think it'll be a playoff route for them. Um, this season, I just think that you know, Drotter does seem to be doing enough. Obviously, Shelburne have put together four wins in the spin, and, and they look to be building. I don't think there'll be any danger of them being in, in, in you know, the playoff spot or relegation. I think you know, they, there's every chance that Shelburne will be able to strengthen in the summer and with, with one eye on Europe, which would be a tremendous achievement for them. I think you know, mid table would have been what they would have been uh, looking at at the start of the season, but uh, when it's like anything, if you put a few wins together. And um, it can really propel you up the table, so they they have a have a chance of of European football where like you know could Bowes, Pax, um, Dundalk, <clears throat> Shelburne, that's all that that will be their focus will be European football. So I do think it's going to be a struggle for Finn Harps, but like I said, I think the fact that UCD will probably get relegated um, leaves it a little bit more attainable to stay in the Premier Division. Yeah, and in, in regards to Shelburne, obviously, Stephen, you know, you know the management team there very well. Obviously, Damien Duff, manager, and uh, Joy O'Brien as assistant, who was on the touchline for three of the four wins um, that they've just had. And uh, in regards to Joey, actually, because I was just listening to some of the post-match audio and um, really seems to be enjoying the coaching role. Um, was he always somebody that you looked at? He seemed, he's always look, come across as somebody that was really professional and, and kind of... Knew, knew what was knew what was about on the pitch and what his job was and again if you got somebody like himself there and obviously everybody knows about Duff are two lads that played right at the top level like for a long periods in their career and that's going to have an effect on these players these players are going to want to go and impress them first and foremost but they're going to have good ideas as well on the game they're going to have a lot of know-how and I think we're starting to see that with Shelburne now there's a little bit of an iffy start where it's taking a little bit of time to get used to this um to this division this division underneath the management with the players they have there. But like Gary said there, I think they will have European football in, in, in the kind of in the back of the mind. He probably known Duffer, he probably won't say it out, out loud. He'll, he'll take every game as it comes and, and kind of each kind of different opposition it'll be it'll be thorough in his preparation. But no, yeah, I think if Shelbourne can kind of go and somehow challenge these European places, it'll be it'll be a great turnaround for the football club. And like Gary said as well, I'm sure they'll be able to add some quality players, whether that'll be players on loan from the UK or other players in and around the League of Ireland. But no, I, I I wouldn't wouldn't surprise me in the slightest if they do end up kind of in them top positions and it'd be a credit to the management team, two lads that are have had great careers themselves and, and and a lot of experience in the game, albeit not in the. I know Joey O'Brien played for a few years in Shamrock Rovers, but they won't have massive experience at the League of Ireland. But again, football isn't massively different no matter where you're playing. It's it's not a complicated game, and these lads know how to how, how to play at the top level, and I'm sure they're learning on the job as well how they can kind of get their ideas across the players. Yeah, and Gary, a final point on Charles before we move on. Um, the uh, the twin, uh, you know, the the twin pillars of this four game winning run, uh, Jack Moylan and Sean Boyd. I mean, in terms of goals, it's basically um, basically themselves kind of driving the, the club forward. Yeah, and and JJ Lunny has come in as well and, and playing in that six, and he's really you know his performances in there probably going go unnoticed a bit like a bit like Chris Shields at Dundalk went unnoticed for about four years, and then everyone was raving about him for his last two or three. You know, so it, it's a case of. You know, that he's been pivotal as well, but the two boys up top and Jack has been, you know, he's had a terrific season. He's been a real threat for them. But, you know, a, a striker that's scoring goals, as Stephen will tell you, he's full of confidence, Sean Boyd. And it's been great for him. I think we're all familiar with his story and his struggles in terms of injuries. 
and it's great to see him um, you know picking up a few goals and really enjoying this football because you know it's, it's great to see a young player who's had struggles and problems um, you know, out there playing football, doing what he loves and, and really enjoying it. I think he has got a really good relationship with Joey O'Brien and obviously look he it Dam he signed for Damien. So it's um I think he he's very happy at the club and you know it's showing on the pitch. Yeah, and we've been on a long marathon, so we're going to wrap up very, very quickly. But first, the first division results, uh, Galway United on Friday beat Athlone Town 3-0, so they're now top of the first division. Treaty United 2, Cove Ramblers 2, Cork City 1, Wexford 1, so Cork City slipping up for the first time in an age. And then on Saturday, Longford Town lost 3-0 at home to Waterford, who are now in good form and trying to chase those top two. Uh, very briefly, Gary, um, in terms of that battle at the top now for the automatic promotion spot, um, uh, John Caulfield in Galway now just uh, taking a small grip of it now. Yeah, and the day after you play each other in uh, AMD Park in Galway at the weekend, so that's going to be a really good game. Um, obviously Cork, you know, I won't say slip up, but they they drew at the weekend, and, and you know, I think Galway will, you know, under John, he knows how to get results, and they they'll etch out the results, but they're starting to they really start to play good football as well, and and. Uh, like it's a really interesting title race. I think you know two really good sides. Obviously, Waterford are chasing behind, and they've got quality. So I think you know if, if the top two start dropping points, you know Waterford will be there. They're trying to capitalise on. Yeah, and in the women's national league, it's actually mirroring the uh, the Premier Division uh, in the men's Premier Division in terms of there's one club, the reigning champion, seven points clear, and then the chasing pack kind of finding themselves in a position that they're they weren't used to. So, uh, Athlone Town, um, who are going really well this season, up in third, beat Treaty United four one. Galway drew one one with Bowes. Wexford Utes drew drew three three with P Mount United. Shelburne, uh, the champions, as I said, beat DLR Waves four nil. Jesu will it break in that game and Sligo Rovers beat Cork City 2-0 so Shelburne now 7 clear and uh, of Wexford and then 10 ahead of P-Mount and uh, also news elsewhere Drogheda United saying they will be competing on the national women's stage very soon so that was a uh, short state just a line in a short statement on their website for more details over the next fortnight and before we go the fixtures first in the women's national league Cork City um, playing Shelburne on Saturday DLR Waves up against Galway Treaty United up against Sligo Bohemians against P-Mount, Wexford Utes against Athlone Town, and they're all Saturday. And then in uh, the Premier Division, so again, as I said, these are the final games before the mid-season break. Derry City in a Northwest Derby with Finn Harps this Friday, 7.45. Bohemians up against Strada United at the same time. Dundalk against St. Pat's. UCD up against Sligo Rovers. And then Shamrock Rovers and Shelburne in the 8 o'clock kickoff at Tala Stadium. And then the First Division, Bray Wanderers up against Athlone Town. Cove Rambers up against Longford Town, Galway, as you said, uh, Gary, against Cork, and Waterford against Treaty United, which brings us to a close. I think we've actually been recording for 90 minutes, which is a number, of course, that both of you would be very, uh, very used to. So I don't know, like, what happens now? Is it just like an ice bath or coffees? Or how does this, uh, how does this work now before? <laughs> you just basically have to, the, you have to advise me. Pops out with a number here for injury time. <laughs> <laughs> I, yeah, I, did, I definitely need a nice bath after that. But look, Stephen and Gary, thanks a million for your time. Take as much of a break as you want now for the next for the remainder of the day. Put the feet up because I've kept you too long. So best luck and Cheers, we'll, be, we'll be back next week.